It's April 27th, 2023, and hundreds of people have assembled in Prince George County, Virginia, on a seasonably warm day to witness a historical event. Conversations die out as three individuals suddenly walk out onto the stage. And when the crowd realizes who these people are, the guests of honor, they all get onto their feet and begin applauding. The first two honorees are Stanley Early and his sister Judith, who are the children of Lieutenant Colonel Charity Adams. The third individual is Lieutenant General Arthur Gregg. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the post-redesignation ceremony, honoring Lieutenant General Retired Arthur Gregg and Lieutenant Colonel Charity Adams. During the ceremony, the base once known as Fort Lee is officially being renamed Fort Greg Adams in honor of the two Army legends. Well, as most of you can imagine, I am standing here just humbled. A few speakers welcome the crowd and discuss the renaming process. And then General General Charles R. Hamilton walks to the lectern and excitedly shares how his own career was heavily influenced by General Gregg. I had the honor of meeting Lieutenant General Gregg in the late 1990s. As I went about my own career, I aspired, like so many others, to be like Lieutenant General Gregg. As General Hamilton describes his mentor's career, the 94-year-old General Gregg calmly sits on the stage, seemingly humbled by all the attention. In his own words, Lieutenant General Gregg taught us that An effective leader must put the mission and those you are leading first and put himself or herself last. He is the consummate mentor, the ultimate leader. He embodies the notion of changing other people's lives or giving back. He embodies, as well as Lieutenant Colonel Adams, selfless service. General Hamilton then puts the renaming of the base into the proper context. Today marks an incredible time in our military and nation's history. Of the nine Army installations that are being redesignated, today marks the first redesignation in the name of Black soldiers. And then General Hamilton points out one final notable fact that brings the crowd to their feet yet again. This is the first time in modern American history that an army installation is being named in honor of a living soldier. Lieutenant General Arthur Gregg is, quite simply, an army legend. Rising from very humble beginnings during which he faced a great deal of racism, he went on to excel during a 30-plus year career, highlighted by becoming the very first African-American to achieve a three-star rank in the Army. Having his name on the new Fort Gregg Adams will most certainly inspire future generations. In today's special episode, our hosts sit down with the now 95-year-old General Gregg to talk about his personal journey, what the Army was like when he first joined, his proudest achievements, and then present him a special award. Before we begin, I should probably point out that we've had a lot of great guests on the show, and this is the first time that everyone at AUSA stopped what they were doing and made a point to come over and meet our guest and shake his hand. It felt like we had a rock star in our midst. And well, that's a pretty accurate description of this living legend. I'm Carrie viro and this is Army Matters. Collins Aerospace, an RTX business, is proud to continue to serve the military as a partner and innovator, leveraging the power of our combined expertise across systems and markets to deliver transformational capabilities to the U.S. Army 
for the multi-domain battle space. Visit www.collinsaerospace.com and see how we're empowering Overmatch for the Army now and into the future. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Army Matters. I'm your co-host, the 15th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Daniel A. Daly, and I have the honor and privilege to work alongside one of the finest gentlemen on earth. Oh, that's so special, Dan. I'm Lieutenant General Retired Leslie Smith, the former Army Inspector General. I'm glad to be on this podcast with you, man. How you doing? What are we talking about today? Well, we got a really cool topic. But before we get into it, I got a few what? questions for you. I got you a question. Do? Can I yeah. ask them back to you? Or is it just an interview of Les Smith only? Well, you, you got you, you do what you always do anyway. Like so interrupt matter. you? <laughs> yeah, you mean, right. Is that what you're saying? Come yeah. on, man. Well, okay, go ahead. All right. So who's the most inspiring Army colleague or veteran that you had the fortune to cross paths with? Oh, wow. That's a hard question. Mm. Let's see. Mm-hmm. I can't pick one because there's right. so many of them. I we'll will say, um, and no specific order of precedence. Just talk about one. Let's talk about one. Uh, okay. I think meeting general, then Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Lord Austin as a battalion commander at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He was really scary then. He's still scary now, but he was really scary then. He is and, a, yeah, uh, intimidating. intimidating, but yeah. when you talk to him, he is a genuine, uh, humble, nice amazing person yeah yeah, yeah but it's it's i would but probably he, say uh him i mean it, then that time frame yeah. as a young captain at, at fort bragg how about you dan me yeah i would say it's chuck norris or chris christopherson chuck norris he's a veteran yeah. okay but chuck norris the gar- the karate chop D- chuck yeah norris. yeah okay well, or Chris Christopherson. Why, why Chris Christopherson? He is a great singer, yes. Yeah, he uh, he was also a U.S. Army Ranger. Oh, cool. In an interview uh, I watched, they asked him, what was the hardest day of your life? He said uh, it was a day in Ranger school. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. But so, honestly, I mean, those yeah. are superheroes. I just wanted people to know that we have veterans all out there across yeah, the world we do. that do great things. This is going to be uh, a little bit different. Um, it was my first squad leader, Staff Sergeant Davis. Okay. And he what made awesome. Staff Sergeant Davis so inspiring? He's responsible for me staying in the Army. Wow. I mean, I was going to get out, not because I hated the Army. Um, I was just, you know, doing what I was supposed to do, come serve my country, go back home, live my life. And and he saw something in me, and he sent me to PLDC, the precursor to the basic leader course now. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, I think you're going to make a great leader someday. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? The, yeah. All it takes is that one person to show us yeah. what those options and opportunities are. Well, you know why we're talking about all this, Les? Why are we talking about this? Because you're going to get the honor and privilege to sit down and talk to a great man. Yeah. It's not often you get a chance to talk to a living legend, a yeah. hero, somebody who blazed the trail for so many people. And an installation was just renamed for him. So if you don't know who it is, is Lieutenant General Arthur Gregg. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm a little jealous. When he came to the, our headquarters to do uh, the podcast, it was just it's like, hey, can we get your autograph? He's like, no, no, not really. But, but, you know, just such a humble man that came from humble beginnings that has made such a difference in the, in the, in the lives of so many other people. He's 95 years old. Now. Yep. 95. But he's doing yep. well, right? Doing well. Still yeah. driving a car. Oh Still talking about different things that he's doing every day. And I'm just like, okay, uh, sir, if we, if we could have half the energy that you have and the, the focus and direction will be great. Get ready for a great podcast. And Les, thanks for doing this. Yeah, too easy, bro. Always good to see you, man. You too. You know, sometimes we have living legends and sometimes we have people that think they're legends. But today we actually have an actual legend. We have Lieutenant General Arthur Gregg here. Sir, how are you doing today? I'm doing very fine, thank you. Good to be with you. Sir, you know, it's, this is such an honor. You're one of my heroes. There's so much to talk about. And, you know, l- let's just jump into the questions, but you can go anywhere you want to with it because, you know, you still outrank me because you're retired. You made general before I was even thought of coming in the Army. This is great. This is great stuff. So we just renamed Fort Lee to Fort Greg Adams. Now... Where were you when you found out it was the installation was renamed? What were you doing? 
Well, I was at my uh, my home. Okay. I received a call from the late Congressman McEachin uh, telling me that uh, I had been selected. Okay. Now, uh, I was aware that uh, uh, the late Congressman uh, had recommended me for uh, for the the renaming of Fort Lee, and uh, I was also aware that there were uh, other organizations and individuals uh, reinforcing uh, that uh, recommendation. I was also aware that the commission convened a hearing in the Fort Lee community. Okay. And some of the people appearing before the commission uh, during that hearing recommended me. So how did you feel once you found that out? Uh, I, I felt very emotional. I felt pride. It was a great feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad I was at home. I'm glad you were at home, too. So hold on for a second. Let's back up a little bit. I want to talk about where some of this great character comes from. You spent your, your time growing up in South Carolina on a hundred acre farm. So, so what were your parents like and how did they influence you? I had great parents and, and they taught me the, the value of hard work and respect for others. As I grew older, I appreciated even more the foundation that I had uh, as a young fellow growing up on the farm. Growing up on the farm. So you used to slop hogs, feed the hogs in the morning? Oh, yes. I, okay. Uh, for, for folks that know slopping hogs, that's how you feed the hogs. You know, uh, uh, we were very much uh, self-sustaining on the farm. Okay. We, we grew uh, uh, a variety of, of vegetables uh, yeah. and fruits uh we had uh hogs and cows okay and of course you had to attend uh to all of those uh uh, uh, uh animals and 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 uh and crops so uh hard work yeah was uh was was a part of our routine day so uh but it was it was an enjoyable period and gave me a good foundation so you were born a year before the Great Depression. Yes. The youngest of nine children. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. So you were the baby. Yes. And, and everybody took, took care of you. That, that's great. So you used to, to walk three miles to classes? Yes. Uh, the nearest school for black Americans uh, was about three miles away. It was a, uh, a three-room uh, building. Um, and, and the, the seven grades were divided among those, uh, three rooms. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, and I, uh, attended that school beginning when I was five years old. Wow. When I finished grade school though, I had a problem. My, my family had a problem because there were no, uh, high schools for blacks in Florence County. Okay, Florence County, South Carolina. Yes. Okay. The the nearest high school was in the city of Florence. Okay. And uh, there was no bus transportation for black students. So uh, in, in that period, 10 miles was 10 miles. Oh, yeah. The, 10 the, miles is the, definitely 10 miles anyway, the, right? The, the first six miles of that 10 miles was on unpaved road. Wow. So uh, attending high school was, was, was a challenge. So fortunately for me, my uh, oldest brother and his family uh, lived in Newport News, Virginia. Okay. And they invited me to come and live with them and attend high school. You mentioned your parents a, a few minutes ago. But you had a, a death happen in your family uh, when you were pretty young. Can you tell us about your mother? Well, uh, my mother uh, had cancer. In 1940 and, f and 41, uh, doctors didn't know that much about cancer. 
Fortunately for us, her brother was a physician in Chicago. He came down and made an examination and, uh, and, and, and discovered that she really had cancer. She was admitted to the hospital, uh, op rep operated on for cancer, mm -hmm. and uh, lived for about six months following that, uh, and, and she passed away. I was 11 years old. Wow. And, uh, and I remained uh, uh, at home mm -hmm. until I finished grade school. So you moved from, from South Carolina. Yes. Florence, South Carolina, and then you get to the big city of Newport News. Yeah. What was the difference? You know, what happened when you left from on the farm to living in Newport News? Uh, uh, as you can appreciate, it was uh, qu uh, quite a change. Oh, yeah. It was the first time I lived in a home where we had uh, 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 indoor uh, plumbing. Indoor plumbing. And, and, uh, and electricity. That was very pleasant. My teachers there were very kind, very supportive. So it was a great experience for me. Uh, I was able to get a job at a laundry and dry cleaning facility. And uh, I worked there in the evenings after school and, and on weekends and, of course, during the summers. And I learned a lot there. I had a great boss and uh, uh, it, it was a good experience for me. Now, I understand that that's where you first saw Army soldiers was at Fort Monroe. Can you give us the first impressions? Well, uh, you know, this is 1941, 1945, yes, the, the height of, the, uh, of World War II. Yes, sir. Many soldiers came to our town uh, on weekends. Okay. And, so they had a lot of money. Well, a lot of money to I'm spend. not sure they had a lot of money, <laughs> but <laughs> but they came. Okay, uh, and, and you know, and I was impressed with their appearance. Okay, I was impressed with their uh, responsible conduct. Okay, uh, and uh, and and also during that time, we had a lot of war movies. Oh yeah. So, uh, and 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 I look forward to one day. Uh, becoming a soldier and and getting in one of those good looking uniforms. So it's the uniform, right? Just like it gets all of us, standing tall and looking good. We always say it ought to be in Hollywood. So, but you didn't enlist immediately. In fact, your original goal was to become a medical technician. Tell us why. I attended the Chicago College of Medical Technology and graduated as a medical laboratory technician in December of 1945. December 1945. I needed experience as a medical laboratory technician, and I was about four months away from my 18th birthday, and okay. at which time I would have been required to register for the draft. Okay. So I reasoned that I could enlist in the Army, get my experience as a medical laboratory technician, and satisfy my military obligation. So in January 1946, I raised my hand and enlisted in the Army. But I understand that you didn't continue as a medical lab tech because of racism. Well, when I finished in December of 1945, I applied for a job at Michael Reese Research Hospital and, and was hired. I was hired by an assistant department manager, and I was prepared to go to work there. But then the departmental boss returned from leave, called me into his office, and uh, made it very clear that my work there would be restricted to the laboratory okay. uh, and to black patients, that I would not be allowed to visit the bedside of white patients. Uh, it did not respect me as an individual or my training, and I resigned. You resigned? Yes. Immediately? Immediately. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you signed up for the Army, and your first assignment was in Germany in 1946. 
just after World War II. A fascinating time to be there. What, what was it like in 1946? Well, the, the destruction of homes and buildings and roads and bridges was in evidence all over the uh, country. And many displaced people. Living was, uh, was a challenge for them, for food and, and other necessities of life. But in spite of that, I got to know many of the local German citizens, and it made life reasonably good. But I spent an unusually long time in the replacement center in Bamberg, Germany. And I learned that the problem was there were no medical laboratories in Germany with a black staff. And they had difficulty finding an assignment for me. The Army was still segregated, right? The Army was still segregated. This was 1946. So one day I was talking with the assignment officer and was overheard by a young African-American lieutenant who was at the center to get truck drivers for his company. And uh, he approached me and said, would you like to come to my company? And I immediately agreed. I had been in the replacement pool for several weeks, and uh, I was ready to move on with an assignment. The, The 3511 Quartermaster Transportation Truck Company was located in Staffelstein, Germany, which is only about 26 kilometers from the replacement center. So I reported, and the first morning that I was there, I wandered over to the supply room and introduced myself to the supply sergeant who was uh, Ray Scarborough from okay. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And you still remember his name, yes. Ray Scarborough. Yeah. <laughs> he had spent enough time in Europe that he was eligible for return to the United States. His challenge was to find a replacement. So I went to work as his supply clerk. And after a few weeks, he declared that I was ready to replace him. And Sergeant Scarborough was able to convince the company commander that I was... So you were PFC. Yes. And then they made you the company supply clerk. Yes. So for our listeners, that's normally a staff sergeant, right, with about 10 to 15 years of of experience. And they're responsible for all of the equipment that a company had. Yes. Wow, that's a big deal. Well, uh, you know, I worked hard to be sure that the company had all of the equipment it needed that the men had the clothing and equipment that they required, and that we got repair parts for our vehicles so that we could perform our operational mission. It was a great assignment. Collins Aerospace, an RTX business, is proud to continue to serve the military as a partner and innovator, leveraging the power of our combined expertise across systems and markets to deliver transformational capabilities to the U.S. Army for the multi-domain battle space. Visit www.collinsaerospace.com and see how we're empowering Overmatch for the Army now and into the future. Welcome back to Army Matters. Now, General Greg, after your first assignment in Germany, you returned to the States and became an instructor at Fort Lee. The very place has been renamed in your honor. Tell us about that. Well, my first assignment at then Fort Lee was in a service company as an assistant platoon leader, but all black officers were assigned to one battalion, and we had more officers than we had positions. I was only there, though, for about three months, and then I started the basic officers course at Fort Lee. Okay. 
and uh, my course was completely integrated. Oh, okay. So things had changed by that time frame. Mm, well, the army had not changed right. by then. Okay. You know, a little bit of history here. President Truman signed the executive order in 1948. But I can tell you that the middle of 1950, the army was still very much segregated. Now, my basic class, the members were integrated. And when I graduated in October of 1950, I was assigned to the quartermaster leadership school. It was completely integrated because the needs of the Korean War, yes, the experience of the Korean War yes, made it easier for the Army to integrate the right. forces than I tell you. And as a result, we became a better army. Yeah, I, I agree with that, yeah. sir. Let's let's jump forward a little bit more. Let's talk about your time commanding the 96th Quartermaster oh, Battalion. the 96th, okay. Yes, sir, in, in Vietnam. Right. In 1965, okay. in November of 1965, I was assigned as the Assistant Secretary to the General Staff of the Army Materiel Command Headquarters who was then in Washington, D.C. And I was promoted to lieutenant colonel. Almost immediately after my promotion, I was notified that I would be assigned to the 96th Battalion, uh, which was then at Fort Raleigh, Kansas, and that the battalion was alerted for deployment to Vietnam. I reported to the battalion in January of 1966, and I learned that the battalion was perhaps at a C4 state of readiness across the board. For our listeners, C4 means like they're not we ready to We didn't have go. The, the people, we wow. didn't have the equipment, we didn't have the training, and we were to deploy in April of that year. In April of that same year? Yes. So I got together with my officers and NCOs, and we started working on a plan to get the equipment and the people we needed and up the training tempo to ready the battalion for deployment. It was going reasonably well, but in March of that year, I had an inspection Uh from the Department of the Army. Was the inspector general come see you? Uh, or somebody else? It was not the inspector general. Okay. It was it was like a maintenance team. Yeah, and he announced what I already knew that right. we were not ready. <laughs> but he was very kind. He, he said, "You have a choice. We can delay your deployment, or if you want to stay on schedule and deploy in April, we will do our best to get you all of the equipment and all of the men that you require." to fully outfit your battalion. And I immediately says, we want to deploy on schedule. On schedule. And the Army did a great job of providing me with the needed equipment and men. And then fortunately, we were one of the few battalions to deploy by ship. And that gave us an additional two weeks to get to know each other and to do some additional training So when when we arrived in Vietnam, I felt that we were ready. And I can tell you, we had uh, some of the best officers and men that you could imagine to have in any one battalion. And they were very responsible and worked their fannies off to turn that location into a great logistics base. So that was in 1966. Six yeah. years later, you made general officer in 1972? That's correct. That's like blazing fast for our listeners. Yeah. And then you, you got a second star in 1976. Correct. Okay. So, so. And a third star the following year. That's amazing. And so your last job in the Army after the Joint Staff J-4. Right. Which you were the first African-American to be the Joint Staff J-4, right? Correct. Okay. Was the Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics. Correct. Were you the first African-American to do that also? Yes. Okay. So a series of firsts is who who you are. Right. Okay. That's that's amazing. So you were the highest 
the Army's highest ranking minority officer serving at the time when you retired. That is correct. Wow, sir. That's amazing. I'm blown away. So now, sir, you, you know, just like all of us, you had a lot of help to achieve this level of success. A major source of that success was now your late wife, Charlene. Can you tell us about her? Why was she the perfect partner for you? You know, when I was commissioned a second lieutenant and came to Fort Greg Adams, yes, sir. then Fort Lee, my friend Sandy McEachin oh, okay. and his wife were yeah. in Richmond, Virginia, okay. not far away. Right. And my wife, Charlene, was the roommate ah. of, uh, of Sandy's wife at Hampton University. And they right. told me about okay. this wonderful lady nice. that I just must meet. So the first free weekend, we drove to Philadelphia. Charlene was doing public health work in Philadelphia. Nice. And I, I met Charlene, and I agreed with all of the strong recommendations that I had received. Charlene and I en enjoyed our time together. Yes, sir. So the next week, I drove to Philadelphia again. Okay. But I did not invite anyone to come with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, That's great. So we had a great weekend romance each weekend. You drove up every weekend? I drove up every weekend. That you could. I may have missed a, a, okay. a couple, but the most weekends I was in Philadelphia. Nice. On the 2nd of September of 1950, we were married at Charlene's family's home in Lynchburg. That's amazing. So one might say that was a very short romance, but I can tell you it was one of the best decisions that I've ever made. For our listeners, his face lit up, his eyes lit up as we're talking here on the on the screen. So we really appreciate you sharing that with us. Sir. Well, and you know, and Charlene took good care of managing the home. Oh, yes, sir. She was a great wife, a great mother. She was very active in the communities wherever we served, and especially the community at Fort Lee. She was a wonderful lady. Yeah. Now, obviously, you've had a fantastic career, but you've also done a lot in post-retirement. What would you say is the proudest moment that you've had after retirement? Well, you know, I would have to say that the renaming okay. of Fort Lee was... <laughs> but there were other moments as well, you okay. know? I had a chance to chair the Board of Governors at Excelsior University. And when I became chairman of the board there, we were able to move it from a state institution to a private institution as a college. And later, it became a university. It's still operating, of course, in Albany, New York. Yes, sir. Right here at AUSA, I had a great experience okay. here. I chaired the leadership committee of AUSA for a number of years, uh, and and later on I, I chaired the uh, the awards committee. Yes, sir. And and I enjoyed both of those assignments. So you know, in closing, what would you tell a, a young person about service, and you know about your service, but why is it important to serve and serve others? Why why is that important for our young people to know? Well, I would say to young Americans that we are fortunate to live in a great country. Yes, sir. And all of us have the responsibility to serve our country. And military service uh, is a high priority. Yes, sir. And, and if you are a member of the military service, that you can find great satisfaction in your work, you can and and uh, and great relationship with your your colleagues uh, and build an outstanding career. So I highly recommend that, sir. We really appreciate you taking the time, and and we're so proud of uh, the uh, renaming of uh, a Fort Lee to Fort Greg Adams, and we just really really appreciate uh, that you're here. And we also, sir, wanted to uh, to make sure that that you know you always have a a home here at AUSA. You're, you're like our big brother, and you've taught us so many different things. I've enjoyed this experience and would be happy to return. Oh, uh, great. Now, before you go, though, oh, it looks like we have a special visitor, and I guess we have to let him in the studio because he's my boss. General Brown is the president of AUSA, and I think he wants to say something. We are honored 
to have you here today, sir. And we're just grateful for your service. To have a hero like you here today is just fantastic. And I, I do apologize. You had to put up with less. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the best we could do right now. And uh, But thank you so much for coming. And, and we just have a little uh, uh, AUSA gift for you to remember this visit by. We called our multi-domain operations gift. It's some... Uh, some coasters we give out, but you could use them as uh, throw them as well for security. So it's not just a land force, but a multi-domain gift. But sir, thank you for coming. Thanks for your incredible service to our nation and your example for all of us. We're just grateful. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate this very much. And I appreciate the opportunity of coming and, and, and speaking with, uh, with Les. Thanks so much, sir. As I said in the beginning of the podcast, You're really a hero of mine, and even more so after chatting with you like this. Thanks for coming in. Collins Aerospace, an RTX business, is proud to continue to serve the military as a partner and innovator, leveraging the power of our combined expertise across systems and markets to deliver transformational capabilities to the U.S. Army for the multi-domain battle space. Visit www.collinsaerospace.com and see how we're empowering Overmatch for the Army now and into the future. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us Army Matters is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission, educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and supporters of a strong national defense. Today's episode was hosted by Lieutenant General Retired Les Smith, and SMA retired Dan Daly, an anchor hosted by Carrie Barrow Heckes. Anthony Del Call is the producer and writer, and Andy Bosnack is the supervising sound editor. Unzinga Curry is the executive producer, and the senior producers are Carrie Barrow Heckes and LaSharon Duncan. Be sure to subscribe to Army Matters wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave a review. As you know, we love seeing stars in the Army, especially if it comes in the form of a five-star review. AUSA's Army Matters podcast can also be heard on Reese Across America Radio on Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, on the iHeartRadio app, the Odyssey app, and the TuneIn app with the search of the word Reef. AUSA's Army Matters podcast primary purpose is to entertain. The podcast does not constitute advice or services. While guests are invited to listen, listeners, please note that you're not being provided professional advice from the podcast or the guest. The views and opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of AUSA. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. I'm Sharon Duncan. Hope you have a great Army day. Hooah.